<laughs> Hello, Internet. I am Ryan Ingram, and this is the Friday morning live stream. And uh, thanks for starting the show off with a phenomenal question about crypto and uh, if I like it or not. <laughs> uh, any question that you might have, including whether or not I enjoy crypto, go ahead and post it in the chat and we will get it answered. So thanks for being here. Um, and as far as the crypto goes, I mean, not really. Uh, do I have money in crypto? Yes. Has it gone up a lot? Yes. Do I recommend it or think it's a good long-term, uh, reliable way to build wealth? No. Do I think in the short term, uh, a lot of people are going to make a lot of money on it? Probably. But I also have no understanding of it. I'm not sure the real world applications of most of them. Uh, from the few videos that I've watched on YouTube about it, I think a lot of it is very speculative. I think a lot of the companies are uh, never going to do anything. And they're just throwing their hat in the ring to see how much it will increase. Um, and kind of profit off the pandemonium surrounding crypto. And I think a lot of the stimulus money that was just printed is probably going to get dumped into crypto as well. So um, my whole strategy is just I put in a small amount and now it's a larger amount. And then at some point we're going to take it out and buy some homes with it. So I don't know. That's my, that's my answer. It's not my scope of expertise. And, you know, the only reason that I'm in it is just to buy more real estate. So whenever it accrues to be enough to buy some properties, we'll do it. We will do that exactly. Hello, JP. But speaking of buying homes, we are doing uh, we're doing that three times today. So on uh, this week, we have purchased four homes. Or we've closed on four homes so far this week. And today we close on three more. One of those is occupied. The other two need work. So uh, also on my list of things to do today is attempt to find another contractor. At this point, all the contractors that we normally use, we've got them backed up a couple projects. And we do our very best to not have any more than 10 open rehab projects going on at one time. And I think we're right at that number. Actually, I can check. I can give you an exact number. Okay. So we're, uh, after today, we will be very far above that number. We will have, Fifteen. So we currently have 13 uh, projects under rehab, and that makes us nervous. Our comfort level is 10. A little bit scary, but we'll get through it. We'll find some more contractors and uh, we'll get some work done. Let's see here. The four that we purchased earlier this week, most of them are good to go. Let me see. Yep, we've already got one of them rented out. Two of them. Two of them are rented out. One was already occupied. Yeah, we're going places. Good job. Good job, team. All right. Let's see. I'm in the wrong. I got too many screens open. All right. Here we go. I'm doing very well. Thanks for asking. I'm really looking forward to speaking with you, man. I really just want to know how to how to say your name and how to how to pronunciate this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Javon Parker. What's up, man? Uh, I'm happy to see you on here again. I'm also happy. I, I saw that you posted a video uh, not too long ago. So way to stay. Way to stay committed to it, man. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your journey about out of state investing with everybody. If I save to burr, it'll take me a year and a half. But if I save to buy, it'll take a year. I don't want to wait, but I recognize how reusing money could speed me up. Thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I've got very strong, uh, not favorable opinions about the, the burr method. So 
here's here's the reason I don't like Burr. I think it's a phenomenal marketing strategy. I think uh, Bigger Pockets did a great job branding it, but at the end of the day, uh, real estate investing, and let's talk about all the different things that you could do to invest in real estate. You can buy a property, you can rent a property, you can rehab a property, you can refinance a property. Uh, you can sell a property. Sell is the only thing that is uh, not listed in the burr. So you're really just talking about real estate investing. Now, is it a strategy? Maybe, but if you just invest in real estate uh, over the course of a decade, at some point, well, you're going to buy a property, you're going to rent a property, <laughs> you're going to rehab a property, uh, and you're going to refinance a property. So how is the strategy any different than the natural course of real estate investing? So if your question is, should you buy a turnkey property or should you buy a property to uh, rehab? then likely you should just go ahead and buy a property that is pretty well rent ready. And the reason I say that is we wouldn't be taking on any rehab projects if we didn't have enough cash flow from the other properties to support those rehab projects. We didn't do our first rehab until we had 23 properties, I think. And that was the first like full blown uh, $30,000 job that we did, but we had 20 properties supporting that. We would not have taken on a large rehab property or project uh, during like our first five or 10 properties. At that point, it's about building up the cash flow and making it a sustainable business. And if you have sufficient capital to burn through enough enough of it to successfully rehab a property, uh, then yes, you will get better returns. But if you're talking about creating and building a sustainable business model, uh, I think it's, I don't think that jumping into renovating a property should be on the forefront of that. I think, especially if the majority of what you're doing is gonna be long-term buy and hold. Did I answer all those? Yes. Yes, I did answer those. Daniel, uh, I don't know how to say that. That A and the O. That A and the O. I don't I don't know how to say it. Yeah, thanks. I've never seen you on here before. So thanks for joining. Um, you're looking for investors for real estate projects. Is this a good channel to look into? I'm looking for investors for real estate projects. I mean, hey, I think I think most people uh, on this on this live stream right now are real estate investors uh, or want to be. So I guess you're in the right the right place for that. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Tolu, welcome back. I sure did. I hope you did as well. Can you please talk more about your app that you are thinking creating? Please use your glasses and beard and the logo. <laughs> yeah, I am in the in the the beginning stages of creating an app. So there's about three apps that I use on a regular basis to analyze uh, rental properties, and one of the main things. Uh, so you know, Deal Check is an app, and it's a great app. I think you should probably use it. Deal Check is the app, and it it pulls uh, tons of data from uh, the internet, probably mainly Google, and they have uh, they just very easily help you analyze a property very quickly. But uh, since a lot of what I do is just kind of like uh, on the back of a napkin type calculations, trying to figure out what the purchase price would be, um, all of our expenses, and all of that. I would just like to create a very easy to use app that uh, has the ability to do a full analysis of a rental property, but also a uh, just like a loan calculator. So sometimes I'm interested in analyzing an entire property. Other times I just want to know uh, how much the, the like what the overall price and the amortization period of a loan would be. So those are like two separate apps. The app that I'm going to create uh, is going to be like a combination of both of those to where there are tabs. 
You can analyze a rental. You can just calculate the loan. Uh, you can save those calculations because another thing on these simple apps that I use, uh, there's no ability to save that calculation. So from the time that I decide that I'm interested in a property to the time that I close on the property, I probably analyze it and punch in the same numbers um, maybe like 20 times. So if I had the ability to save it, I could just look back at the calculations that I already did. So we're going to have that feature there as well. And then uh, very selfishly, the fourth tab is going to be some of the cool affiliate links and just ways to connect with me. So it's just, uh, you know, a really fun, easy to use, nitty gritty, no fluff type uh, calculator. So hopefully you guys find it to be of great value. I sure do hope so. I don't know anything about the logo yet. I think we're going to call it... Uh, we have, I have a call later today to discuss like the design of the app, the branding of it. Uh, but I think it's just going to be uh, the Ingram rental calculator. And ultimately, I want the app and the YouTube channel to kind of work together. So obviously, the app would be a way to provide additional value to you all to help you um, kind of in your pocket analyze a property the way that I would. And also... Um, if someone is looking for a rental calculator and they download mine, then it would also point you back to the YouTube channel. So at the end of the day, uh, all we're trying to do is help people create generational wealth and have the confidence to go out and invest in real estate, cut through all of the uh, overly complicated gurus out there that make you feel like you're dependent on them and really just um, help build you up to have all the tools, the resources, and the know-how that you need to without paying for any of it. So that's uh, that's what I like. Thanks. Thanks, 37. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're so silly. Uh, thanks for thanks for uh, showing me half of your face so I know exactly who you are and consequently not creeped out by this. How long are the inspections taking for Dayton, say, for a plumbing rough-in, for example? So fortunately, we don't do many of these. Uh, in the city of Dayton, the only reason that you would need your plumbing inspected is if it is a new build or if there was some sort of like significant damage to the property. Um, if you're just going in to a property and replacing the, pl the plumbing, you really don't need an inspection at all. So uh, we don't do any new builds. Uh, that fire damaged property, we did have to do a lot with inspections there. The turnaround time from us scheduling it to them getting out there was generally about two business days, which isn't bad. Uh, the only problem that we ran into is we failed all of our inspections multiple times. I think we actually maxed out the number of times you could fail inspections before they kind of like have to pass you. And my frustration there, which I may, I may just be, so I'm super naive. I'm very, I'm very ignorant to their process. It was the first time that I did it. But what was most frustrating to me was inspector number one would come out and give me three or four, he would fail me and give me three or four items that I needed to fix. I would fix those items and I would call for an inspection again. Uh, inspector number two would come out and they would fail me and identify three or four additional reasons uh, that inspector number one did not point out. And then I got, I started getting very angry when I would fix inspector number two's list to call for another reinspection. Inspector number one came back out and failed me for three or four additional items. It's just like there, there, there should be some sort of scope. Like I'm not arguing that all of these things didn't need to be fixed, but I am arguing the fact that each of these inspectors had ample opportunity to point out all of these items the first time. Even the second time, if you found something that you didn't see the first time, totally understandable. Um, but at, at one point, I just felt like I was getting bullied. And each time I called the, uh, you know, whatever you want to call them, the, the inspector's office, I would try to really get a firm grasp on exactly what I needed to do and in what order I needed to do it. And 
at the very best, Montgomery County was extraordinarily unhelpful. So um, that's my frustration. Thank you for asking me a question of which I didn't really know how to answer, but it allowed my soul a very good place to vent. Man, that's awesome. Good morning. I'm happy to see you back. It's been a couple of weeks. I'm not sure. Uh, I think, I don't think it's going to take long. Actually, I've got an email somewhere. I don't know. I wouldn't know where to find it. Um, I, I, probably like two or three weeks. I'm really looking forward to it. I saw on the Sellers Disclosure Foundation is settling. Please explain the meaning, cost, <laughs> implications, and risk. Uh, I don't, uh, all foundations settle. And I think if, I think probably in the house that you live in, in the hotels that you've stayed in, uh, anywhere. And once you, uh, once you know what to look for, you'll never not see it again. But a lot of times when, uh, it, it's really common and easy to see like on a door frame, uh, generally from like one of the top corners of the door frame, you'll just see like a crack go out at like a 45 degree angle. Uh, that's generally just like the foundation settled a little bit. Um, all foundations settle regardless. So, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be worried about that. What I would, what, if, if I saw that, uh, what I would assume is that there are some cracks in weird places that make people worried, but I don't really think there's a cost to it. Um, obviously you would want to have like a contractor or some sort of professional to like go down to the basement or the slab, inspect the slab, whatever it is and figure out, uh, is this something that is finished or will it continue to settle? And likely unless the ground shifts or the ground has a propensity to shift after the house is built, I really think, uh, f the foundation settling is like a one-time thing. So I think they're likely just trying to explain like some gaps in the walls or like some cracking in areas. But to your point, you should probably get a contractor out there to look at it. Um, foundation issues. It really depends. It's one of those things that could be extraordinarily expensive if you want to have like architectures and engineers and whatnot come out, inspect it and make sure and like give their little stamp of approval of like this will never happen again. But, you know, if it's like a hundred year old house, well, you're out in Texas. So if it's like a 50 year old house and it's still standing, um, I mean, that's a good indication that the foundation is probably solid. So you might just have to you know, spend a grand or maybe even less to install a jack if there's a basement uh, in, in, in the appropriate area, shore up some of the areas that are having trouble. Um, I don't know, foundation issues are one of those things, like foundation issues and mold, uh, those are two things that people uh, are able to use to negotiate an extraordinary amount of money off of the purchase price. <laughs> And from an investor perspective, especially if you have some really helpful uh, contractors that truly have your best interest, you can pick up some really good deals and you could fix it for much less than you're able to negotiate off the sale price. So we had a basement wall collapse um, because of a groundwater issue. We didn't divert the groundwater properly for several decades. Now, I only owned the house for like two years, but I didn't catch it and never like did anything with the gutter system, but it cost us 19, 16 to 19 grand to uh, fix that. And that was with an architect and an engineer stamping it off. Nice. Thank you, man. I hope you loved it. Obviously it made you think of me. So thank you. <laughs> uh, what's the process on buying a rehab property? Uh, just identifying a property that is in disrepair or distress and then uh, committing <laughs> committing to purchasing it and then fixing it. Let's see. I will show you one of the properties that we're purchasing today, maybe. If I can find it.
Let's see if I can do this. I don't know how to share my screen on this software. But yeah, I mean, just identifying a property that is uh, in disrepair and negotiating a good price on it and then working with contractors and figuring out exactly what the overall uh, cost to repair it is going to be. So generally, your purchase, if you're buying a rehab property, I would say the purchase price plus the estimated cost of repairs, you should stay under like 70 to 75% of the loan to value. So like if it appraises for a hundred grand, you want to be able to purchase it and rehab it for less than 75,000. So that ensures that you are being appropriately rewarded for taking a bad property and making it a good property. It also means that when it's time to refinance, you can pull out all of the money that you have inside the property. No, you didn't miss it. Thank you. I appreciate you always asking. Uh, the firehouse is going to be officially done on Monday. So we act, we finally fixed the heating and air issue. We made the downstairs return about three times larger. And I think that was the issue. We just They just made a miscalculation on how much return was needed versus the supply provided. Uh, so that is good. That is now fixed. And uh, all of the pipes that were bursting, uh, we replaced in PEX, that slowed us down. And other than that, um, the only thing that's left is the carpet, which is being installed on Monday. And I don't know why I went carpet on this one rather than throwing down some vinyl plank. I really couldn't tell you. So the bedrooms, well, and the, and the, up, the upstairs bedrooms and hallway will be carpet. Uh, all the downstairs is ceramic tile. And then the upstairs bathroom is vinyl plank as well. So that'll be done. And let's see. The commercial property, we got that successfully demoed. So now everything that was once downstairs in the commercial area is now no longer there. So we got rid of the bar, all of the flooring, and it's a blank slate for us to go ahead and install a kitchen um, and turn it into a Mexican restaurant. So we are actually going to redo the exterior to make it look like a uh, old style cantina. We've got one shot. I mean, it hasn't been a good commercial property for the community for quite some time. So we're going to try to make it look very inviting and um, very appealing for people to come in and enjoy some tacos. Thanks, Lewis Porter Jr. I really appreciate you asking. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. That's a that's a very good question. All of my properties are in Ohio, and all of my properties are very close together inside of Dayton, Ohio. I'm not bashful. I'm not a I'm not a hard person to find. A quick Google, uh, and people could find my office address. I own an insurance agency as well, and uh, it's pretty it's pretty easy to find me. That is true. You're very correct. Good morning. You can get a FHA 203K loan for properties. Generally, the most common uh, properties that FHA 203K loans are used for are HUD homes. An FHA 203K loan, you have to be... Uh, the owner occupant for some specific amount of time. I'm really not sure, but because the HUD homes uh, are already owned by the federal government, it's easy for the federal government to loan you money to buy one of the properties they already own <laughs> and then rehab it. It's a good deal. I don't know anybody that's done one. Uh, I've never done one, so it can be done. And it probably should be done. Oh, that makes sense then. So yeah, it's only a decade old. Uh, it probably is settling. So yeah, I mean, in that case, I would just make sure that uh, it's done 
settling and that there's no uh, ground issues that are going to make it get any worse. Good morning, JJ. I'm happy to see you here. Oh, you had a uh, bathroom vent. I would love to hear an update about your bathroom, bathroom, bath, bathroom vent. English is my first and only language. Is there an app that can automatically send alert reminders to tenants? Uh, I think most of them do. Um, I think we use Appfolio. You have to have 50 or more properties, I believe, to do that. But other people use like apartments.com. I'm not quite sure what type of reminders you're looking to send. <laughs> a reminder to clean the bathroom vent? Maybe not. A, a reminder to pay rent? Yes, probably so. <laughs> Uh, I think it's a personal preference. Uh, LVP would definitely be cheaper to lay and repair ceramic tile. Um, I think the only reason that ceramic tile was used here was because it's on a slab. So it's just putting tile right on top of concrete. The only thing that I don't really like about ceramic tile is like if the if there's like I don't know if there's like a transition area if, if the part is higher or lower if there's any sort of imperfection. Uh, in the subfloor, then the, the tile will likely crack, whereas the LVP would just kind of bend or give away. Uh, as soon as I get them, for sure, but it's going to be a long road. And uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, on this project, I don't know of any way that I could I don't know of any way that I could truly break down the numbers in a fair fashion uh, until after everything is complete and it's actually uh, making money and returning it for us because we have no concept of how much money this property is going to make once we build it out. And I don't know of any accurate way to predict it because this is way outside of my scope of expertise. We definitely, though, we every time we spend any money, uh, we break down our finances by class and the class is the individual property. So I will easily be able to look back and figure out exactly how much money we spent on this property and what it was for. So um, I'm happy to share how much money I'm spending but there's no clear way to even project the returns because of the structure that we'll be doing with the Mexican restaurant. It really depends on how well the Mexican restaurant does, honestly, as to what the true returns would be. Um, we negotiated some ownership of the Mexican restaurant, so it would be uh, profit-based. I'm optimistic about it. There's a, a restaurant that is always packed uh, right across the street. So we should be able to mooch off of a little bit of their traffic so long as we can uh, produce a good, a good quality. Yes. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. I have every intentions of producing videos again at some point. <laughs> oh. Well, that's the end. You guys can't be out of questions already. We're only 28 minutes into this. Let's see. While you guys are thinking about more questions to ask, I'm going to figure out how to share my screen. because we've had a lot of questions about rehab projects. Oh man. I have to change my computer settings to make this screen share happen. I guess I've never done this before. Okay. Yeah, I won't be able to make changes uh, until I would have to restart, which means I would have to close this out and do it later. 
or close it out and end the live stream and then come back. And that's that's not necessary. All right, let's see here. Explain 1031 exchange. No idea, Tolu. No idea outside of my outside of my scope of expertise. Let me throw up this disclaimer that reminds everybody how how silly how silly I am and how little I know. Um, it is from what I understand about 1031 exchanges is it is a way to defer the amount of taxes that you would pay by selling one property and immediately purchasing another one. I think. Uh, once you sell a property and deem it a 1031 exchange um, so that you don't have to pay like capital gains tax, you have 60 or maybe 90 days to identify a property that you want to purchase. And then you have six months to actually close on the property. So that's a CPA question, not a Ryan Ingram question. Um, but I know that if you don't want to pay capital gains and you want to buy more real estate, uh, it's a really good, it's a really good tool, a really good avenue to use to kind of kick your taxes down the road. Um, I mean, not really, you know, I don't, I don't like partnerships or joint ventures uh, on this Mexican restaurant. We are just because the build out costs are so high on this one um, that the build out costs are one where, we would not be able to charge the appropriate amount of rent to make up for uh, the costs. So the partnership of the restaurant is kind of the avenue that we we're thinking about taking. Um, but by and large, I don't know where we're at. We just don't necessarily need partnerships or joint ventures. Um, I am a fan, I guess, of, I don't know. It's a convoluted question. Convoluted. Can you use business credit for a loan to purchase homes? Probably, but where does that business credit come from? Um, generally running a business. There are some YouTube people that talk about building business credit, but they don't actually have a business. And I'm just skeptical on that kind of thing. And I guess you could probably manipulate the system a little bit, but at the end of the day, if you're working with a, a uh, smaller bank, they're most certainly going to want to see a profitable business. I guess if you're just to kind of manipulate the system, you don't really have a business, but you you somehow whip up business credit, uh, you might be able to trick some of like the Chases, the Wells Fargo, the really big box stores that might not necessarily do the same level of due diligence. But uh, those same banks don't necessarily want to lend on one property in the name of an LLC. So most Chase and Wells Fargo's don't do portfolio loans on single family homes so much as they just do a bunch of Fannie Freddie stuff. And then if you're doing Fannie Freddie stuff, um, they can't be in the name of an LLC. So those are, those are all my thoughts on the question that you just asked. <laughs> I think that's probably helpful. Uh, all the local banks that we work with, they want to see before they before they used our business income um, to qualify us to buy additional properties. We had to have two years tax returns from the rental properties in the name of a business. So business credit, I don't know. Business credit is probably just as worthless as your normal credit. Hard money. Can you please break it down? Cost, fees, processes, and all it entails? I guess so. Uh, I've never used hard money, but generally hard money is anywhere between 10 and <laughs> uh, infinite percent. So I think the highest one I've seen was like 20%. Uh, generally with hard money, you still have all of the things that you would have with a traditional bank. You would have the appraisal. Uh, you'd have the origination fees. So origination fees for hard money, it's whatever the hard money person wants to charge. I've seen as little as 1%. I've seen as high as, I don't know, I guess 4% uh, is the highest I've seen. And that's a percentage of the total overall loan. So if you're borrowing hundred grand, the origination fee is gonna be four grand, which is pretty significant. So I think if you're doing uh, flips or if you get like a phenomenal deal on a single family home, uh, you might be able to withstand such hard, high origination fees, especially if you're flipping properties and you're able to build in 
uh, those costs to like the retail costs, then sure, it might be worthwhile. And at the end of the day, if you're successful and you made 20 grand um, on the flip, even though you spent six grand on origination fees, then it might work. Uh, but I, by and large, stay away from hard money loans because of the the high origination fees. Um, I guess in theory, you could refinance out of them and get that money back when you refinance with traditional money. But if you can acquire properties without using hard money, then you're probably better off than using hard money. But at the same time, if you can make money using hard money, then why not? It's really about, I guess, the total overall resources available to you. <laughs> oh, thanks. I appreciate it, man. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. Hey, you think she would want to... Uh, get that bathroom fan cleaned out. But that's okay. It's just a bathroom vent. I think I think the downside of them not maintaining the bathroom vent is pretty low. Restaurant equal cash flow. You do rehabs, good marketing. You're good, Ryan. I see bright future for you. I am so happy to find your channel. I will revisit for sure. Thanks, man. That's really nice. If I could if I could give this a heart or a thumbs up, I would do it. I'm really jealous of the laid back approach Dayton has versus where I am in Cincy. So far, my general contractor has been passing all inspections the first time. It's just we have to wait a long time for them to inspect. Hey, move on up to Dayton, man. We need all the help we can get. Come on up. And uh, who knows? Dayton might not be laid back. Maybe I'm doing all of this wrong. Maybe me even talking about this. This is the paranoid tinfoil cap wearing Ryan coming out here. But maybe this entire time I should have been getting permits and I haven't been. Uh, that would be bad. I would be embarrassed, but I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Uh, the only time that we regularly pull permits is if the electric or the gas have been off for quite some time, uh, which is common because we, you know, we rehab a bunch of distressed properties. And then whenever they turn it back on, uh, before they do that, we have to have a permit. The county or city has to come out and inspect that for the gas lines, the pressure's good. And then it's just like a visual inspection on the electric. Uh, generally, the electric inspectors are pretty familiar with the contractors, the licensed contractors that are able to pull the permits. So pretty easy, pretty smooth process. But as far as like interior rehabs, uh, replacing drywall, renovating bathrooms and kitchens, we really don't have to. Uh, we actually just bought a property in a historic district and we renovated it. And I was really scared about the permit process there. But after talking with the city for a very long time about this, they are only concerned about the exterior stuff. So we need to get like uh, approval before we do things like windows or doors or anything with like the porch, paint, roof, chimneys, anything exterior. Um, However, when it comes to the interior, we can pretty well do uh, whatever it is that we want to without needing to notify anybody. So even though I'm paranoid, uh, I'm probably still doing the right thing. Boy, but you're making me doubt myself, Cosmic Wisdom. At least three weeks for each one. That is, that is horrifying. Yeah, that's a project killer. But hey, the government's got to get their money. You answered it in the simplest way. I don't need a CPA. <laughs> Thank you. You always need a CPA, Tolu. Don't let the IRS sneak up on you. But again, I'm just one of these paranoid people. In regards to the app, have you thought about producing a real estate game app that did what you did in real life? That is phenomenal. I am not a uh, computer person, but that sounds like a really fun game. Man, I, that sound that would really suck me in. I would do that probably more feverishly than I would I would build my actual portfolio. Hmm. I'll have to think on that. That's a good idea. Man, you're always you're always coming up with good ideas. I've scoured the internet trying to find one and can't find a single one. Could your app guys do that? Maybe. I don't see why not. Uh, I'm kind of scared to think about the price tag on it, but um, we'll see. This app, I don't think it's like 
a secret or anything. This app uh, costs, I think when it's all said and done, depending on how many changes I make, he gave me like a whole bunch of list of options on did I want people to have a login? Did I want people to be able to like uh, store their reports on the cloud? And a whole bunch of stuff like that. And we went bare bones. So again, paranoid tinfoil cap wearing Ryan. I want you guys to be able to use this app for free as much as you would like and not provide me with any of your information. So there's not going to be like an email required. Nothing is going to be stored on the cloud. It's not going to be invasive at all. You can do whatever you want to analyze as many properties. Uh, the only downfall of having it set up that way is uh, if anything happens to your phone, if you lose it, if you get a new phone, none of those will... Um, None of those will transfer. So if you lose your phone, you've lost all of your all of your uh, analysis. But we are going to try and figure out a way that you can like export them and email them to yourself or download them locally. So hopefully that works. Uh, again, non-invasive, just trying to add value and help. Oh, the whole reason I said that was that app is going to cost us like I think right around five grand. So it'll be fun. It'll be very much so worth it. But then you start talking about a game, man, that I, I think that would likely be in the six figure range. Very fun, very addicting, but very expensive. Yeah, hard money, hard money is just uh, individuals or smaller institutions that have a significant amount of money. Um, there's not. There's not too many regulations on that industry outside of like usury laws and whatnot uh, on a statewide basis. So you can almost do whatever it is that you want to, so long as I guess it's, it's, it's reasonable uh, in light of the usury laws. So, And then I think so long as the properties aren't owner occupied, then um, it's pretty pretty loosey goosey on the regulations. And then if it is an owner occupied property, that's when that's when things really tighten up and you have to be able to check certain boxes and do certain things. So it's up to the individual. And to a certain extent, uh, the commercial lending side of the banks is up to them too. It's a little bit more loosey goosey than like the, you know, like all the personal accounts. Once you switch over to commercial, uh, the banks, the banks are able to have preference. How many deals are in the tank for you right now? I keep missing stuff due to seller's market. Let's see, look at this. We have, let's see here, under contract. We have 25 properties under contract. 25. That's funny that you say that, Lewis Porter Jr. Actually, the title company that we use, we always close at the same title company. And uh, the lady sat down with me this past week. And this week so far, we've closed four properties and we're closing another three today. And uh, on Tuesday when we were closing, she looked at me and she was just like, every other person that I am speaking with says that it is impossible to find a good deal right now. And here you are uh, closing properties that are good deals. She made that assessment um, every week. <laughs> How are you doing it? And I think that's a really good point. And I mean, I think it really just comes down to uh, deal flow. And I, I've been trying to loosely form this idea in the back of my head as I've been thinking throughout the day, because I do my best to think most days. Um, how to compare uh, streams of income to like the streams of deal flow. And just like how you hear like, you know, wealthy people or whatever, say that you should have like seven streams of income. I think on a real estate perspective, depending on what type of portfolio you're trying to build, right? But like, since we are trying to build a massive portfolio of single family homes, it's not like we can go out and buy, you know, 90 units in one stroke, like the multifamily guys can. We're buying 90 individual properties. So uh, just the volume that that kind of generates it's imperative that we have, you know, multiple streams of deal flow. So I, I don't think though that your uh, streams of deal flow can be as diverse as streams of income. So just like thinking off the top of my head and you guys feel free to help me, but I think you've got, you know, realtors, obviously, 
and I'm going to separate, I'm going to say realtors and the MLS. I'm going to keep those two separate because realtors, uh, believe it or not, uh, start marketing their properties prior to them going on the MLS. So just because you have the ML access to the MLS or you monitor houses for sale, it's also it's still very important that you have a strong network of realtors that are uh, out there looking for deals for you. You've got wholesalers as well. Um, and then you've got, you know, kind of word, word of mouth. And I guess inside the word of mouth, I'm going to use, I'm going to say like, because me, I do my very best every time I ever meet anyone to talk about real estate investing, because at some point that person is going to know or meet someone that has a property to sell. And I would love for, for me to be top of mind when that comes up. Um, and also like we've, we've purchased several homes from, uh, just word of mouth from like our contractors. They know somebody that wants to sell a home. Um, and they'll tell me about it and give me their information or vice versa. Um, let's see here. What else? Like direct mail marketing. That's a real thing. And then also like prop stream seven day free trial, Lewis Porter jr. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did I, did I pin that comment? Let me do that really quick. You guys stare at my uh, affiliate link for prop stream right in the face. Let's see. There we go. Nice. Good job, Ryan. <laughs> oh, what a goofy, goofy guy. So yeah, uh, what did we get up to? Six and prop stream was number six. Can we come up with one more? Are you guys helping me? Nope. Nope. You guys aren't coming up with any ideas. 16 people. Okay, I don't know how many people were on there. Uh, I hope I didn't lose anybody during that long rant of me thinking out loud. Let's see. Six. Can we come up with a seven? It'll be fun to have seven. Direct marketing. Prop stream. MLS. Foreclosures. How, how could I have forgotten? My best performing video on YouTube. Yeah, so uh, foreclosures. That's number seven. And inside the foreclosures, you've got the HUD homes. Sheriff sales. Tax liens. And bank owned properties. Uh, bank owned seems kind of like a cop out because bank owned are at some point. They're one of the other threes, too. Then they're just owned by the bank. No, nah, let's leave it in there. So, yeah, now we're at the eight streams of deal flow. The eight streams of deal flow. What a great title for a video. You're right, 3747. I should do that. Hey, man, thank you. I appreciate it. I think just as highly as you. How can I leverage my credit cards? I have over $150,000, which I can do balance transfer. Okay. If I had $150,000 of credit limit available to me, how would I use that to buy properties? If they let you do cash advances or take cash out. And there's actually a website that lets you, now they charge you like 2% or whatever, but pretty much that company um, acts like as like a third party vendor and they will charge your credit card, take their little processing fee, and then they'll deposit that money into your bank account. Um, I don't remember that. And the whole reason or they'll, yeah, they'll send out a check for you and they do that so that people could <laughs> take, take more, take advantage of, uh, like they could pay their mortgage and get credit card points with it. Um, so yeah, I would probably, I would probably use that $150,000 to buy and rehab a property. Uh, but before I would do something like that, because that's a very high 
percent. So two things are going to happen. Uh, first, you're going to pay way too much in interest. So even our hard money loans are like 12%. Um, but those are over like an annual hard money. See, look, Tolu, you got in my head. <laughs> I don't use hard money. Uh, the money that we borrow from friends and family uh, that's secured by first position mortgages is at like 12% while we bundle those up and then do a big refinance. So you're going to pay, I don't know what most credit cards are, 18, 20 something percent. We've got one of our local banks gave us a credit card that has like an 8.5% interest rate. That's pretty cool. And we have purchased properties with that credit card uh, and rehab properties with that credit card. We do that very regularly. So, and then the second thing that's going to happen is if it's attached to your personal name, then when you utilize your credit cards to purchase a property and renovate a property, you are going to temporarily tank, absolutely tank your credit score for having an extraordinarily high utilization rate. Now, whenever the property is refinanced and you pay off those credit cards, you will, um, you will salvage your credit score once more. But if you do that, then while you have such high utilization, if you try to do anything else, purchase a home, purchase a vehicle, uh, do anything that people check your credit for, they're likely going to look at you very confused and deny you, probably. Let's see. So I guess it's risky in that sense because if the market turns, if banks change the rules, if for whatever reason you need to refinance and you can't, or if you are then forced to sell the house for lower than you have into it. Now, I think currently the chances of that happening are pretty slim, but I'm just trying to think about all the pros and cons here for you. The, the biggest pro though, is it makes for a really cool story to tell somebody that you purchased a home with a credit card. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Let's see. Cameron Bennett. I'll tell you what, man. Thanks. You spoiled me. Last time you said cup of coffee on me. And hey, I bought a cup of coffee. Thank you. Thank you, Cameron Bennett. I'll buy another cup of coffee. Let's see. My primary house is in a federal historic zone. They get anal about exterior work. They do. But, you know, I can dig it. I like it. I'm a fan of these property are, you know, just an area, uh, being kept to high standards. So, and preserved, I like it a little bit. As a follow up to your story about the inspectors, may I suggest to use one only you give him deal flow. He will give you, Oh, see, that's a good idea. But we're not talking about uh, like home inspections. We're talking about uh, municipality inspections like uh, and we have no control over who comes out. We're talking about like the city wants to come out and inspect a uh, some one of your contractors work. We're not talking about like inspect to like a like a home inspection that you would get done as you're buying a property. But. I definitely agree with what you're saying there. If you're going to use an inspector, I would buddy up with them and use that one person. I've been focused on seller finance deals. No more banks or hard money for me. Yeah. Well, hey, man, that's why that's why you're losing out on all your deals. Then Lewis Porter Jr. You're rolling in asking people <laughs> to sell or finance when they uh, are getting other offers that are way above market. Now, maybe you could change up your seller financing pitch and strategy. I went to this one there was like the one of those real estate investors association meetups they're like annual large event where they bring all of the people that want to sell you real estate courses in the one spot and try to get all of your money in in three days um the little free section that i sat in though where he was ultimately making like a two hour long sales pitch sprinkling in helpful information uh i think i can't remember what his program was called but it was pretty much talking about how to get people to agree to seller financing at 0% interest. And pretty much all he did was, I mean, if you look at the amortization period or amortization schedule, uh, let's say you want to buy a property over 10 years. 
at 10% or something or 8% and you see like the total amount paid, he would offer something uh, like 25 to 30% less than that total interest uh, or total amount paid. So he would go in way over asking, like if a property is worth a hundred grand, he might offer 170 grand and just ask that it be like 0% amortized over, you know, 10 years. That number's a little bit high, maybe 140 grand. And then a lot of people just, they see that, they see that big number. And like, of course, of course I would sell my property for $40,000 more than it was worth. Ah, but here's the catcher, 0% interest over 10 years. Some people go for it. Do you need an LLC to be an investor? No, you're going to be an investor right now under your personal name. One of the investors that I know has like 50 or 60 properties all in his personal name. He's pretty cool. Or how can an LLC help to the buying process? Honestly, it doesn't. Honestly, uh, it might even hurt the process, especially if you're going to try to get like a Fannie Freddie loan. Uh, I think the biggest, the biggest issue that people have when they form an LLC, they buy a property in cash, they put it in the LLC, but then they want to refinance it. And then they uh, want the best terms, of course. So then they get a Fannie Freddie loan, but the Fannie Freddie loan requires that it be in the personal name. So then they have to do a quick claim deed to get it out of the LLC and into their personal name before they can close. So, you know, that kind of, that kind of unwinds uh, all the work that you just did in creating your LLC and purchasing a property into your LLC. But also if you just, uh, you know, go to the commercial side, you won't get as good of terms, but, um, you could keep the property in your LLC. And I am uh, an advocate of keeping properties in LLCs rather than your personal name, not for the liability protection, uh, for nothing else other than, like I mentioned earlier, banks want to see about two years tax returns from your rental properties before you are able to like get bank money based on the, the income of the business. So, if you keep your properties in the LLC, presumably you're going to get your two years tax returns a lot faster than if they're in your personal name. Hey, look at that. What a good idea. Increase your deal flow and, uh, and analyze like a pro today using PropStream. Code violations. You are a code violation, Lewis Porter Jr. My girlfriend is starting a YouTube channel. What's the basic lighting camera stand and microphone? You have a great setup. Thanks, man. Um, I'm a fan of newer N E E W E R for lights. Uh, these little blue things behind me, the sunshine is too serious though. Now that it's not winter anymore, I'm going to have to get some like blackout curtains or something because that sunshine is taking away all my blue. I don't look cool anymore. Yeah. Newer for lights. They're my favorite. Uh, this camera that I'm using is the Logitech webcam. I don't know. Logi webcam, Logitech. And then as far as microphones go, I would recommend, uh, I've got this Yeti in front of me right now, but I only use it whenever, whenever I'm on this live stream. Uh, I bought it when I was like doing a podcast for just a little bit. Um, when I actually record the YouTube videos, it's called like Sar Sarmonic, Sarmonic, S A R M O N I C. I like it a lot. And then I have a Canon. I have a Canon uh, M50. I like that a lot too. That's the recent high quality thing. And then these lights. I think I think people on the internet for some reason, I don't know why, but people love looking at lights in the background. There we go. We're missing something. It's got this little remote. It lets me change the colors. Let's get purple to match. Yeah, there we go. Now we're really cooking. Uh, I even find myself judging other people's YouTube channels based on how many pretty lights they have in the background. So I put pretty lights on my bookshelf and said, now I'm a professional. <laughs> Thanks for being, uh, for bringing entrepreneurs valuable content on a consistent basis. Thank you, Cameron Bennett. I appreciate you saying that, man. Zero interest for 18 months. By golly, go at him, man. Take that 150 grand, buy you uh, three Ohio properties.
Hey, look at that. I need about 35,000 rehab, 1015 Broadway. Come on now, man. Don't call don't don't call don't call, don't call Broadway an up and coming area. I'll probably buy it though. 1015 Broadway. Now that you mentioned it, man, 1015 North Broadway. Let me look this bad boy up. You know what? I'm going to click on over to prop stream. I don't know how you've been trying to reach me though, man. I got you in my phone. I'm sure it's a me problem, not a you problem. I also still want that three unit that you were trying to sell too. Let me see. I'm going to text you right now. Deal make on the live stream. That's the ninth that's the ninth uh, avenue of deal deal flow. YouTube. <laughs> oh. Let's talk. Cool. Done. 1015 North Broadway. Now I'm looking it up on uh, PropStream. Uh, click the link below for your free your free seven-day trial. That eighth day, though, that eighth day comes fast. They're going to get you. It's $97 a month after the seven days. But it's well worth it, 100%. Oh, it's a duplex. Yeah, let's talk about it. We've got a few in that area. And that is also not where I expected it to be. I must be thinking about South Broadway. I now agree with you that that area is up and coming. Salem, anything off Salem is uh, probably a good, a good deal at the moment. They're putting a lot of work in on Salem, especially that uh, that little co-op that they did. I don't know where that is in relation to this property, but that co-op is probably going to be pretty good for the community. All right. Cool. Yeah, let's talk. I know this has been covered before, but could you briefly explain your interpretation of an FHA? I don't mean to make your content over redundant, just trying to catch up. Yeah. Uh, what does FHA stand for? Federal Housing Authority? I think that's all it really is. Federal, Federal Housing Authority. My interpretation. Federal Housing Administrate. Wait, 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 wait. People have looked at it both ways. Federal Housing Administ. Okay. Federal Housing Administration. So they're pretty much just like the company that, oh, Franklin D. Roosevelt founded it. I didn't know that. Uh, National Housing Act of 1934. I don't know what your question is, but I don't think I don't think this is a thing that's left that's left open for interpretation. <laughs> um, the Federal Housing Administration. They're the ones that I think uh, kind of dictate what Fannie or Freddie does and they provide really, really good deals on home home loans uh, because they're federally backed. They're backed by the taxpayers of the United States of America. And if somebody uh, stops paying their mortgage on a property that's backed by Fannie or Freddie or the government, if it's a Fannie Freddie loan, it's backed by the federal government. So it's a, and then whenever someone is foreclosed on, it turns into a uh, federally owned property or like a HUD home, housing housing and urban development, HUD. Um, and then, so those, it, those are a HUD home. And then you can get a, an FHA 203K loan, which is just a government loan for owner-occupied properties that need rehab work. So generally speaking, if you're going to use an FHA loan, the property has to be perfect. It can't have any outstanding. Um, it can't have any outstanding, like distressed, deferred maintenance. That's what I'm trying to say. So, yeah, those are my thoughts. 
How fast do you pull money out of properties after purchase? Um, I don't know. I mean, the way that our business model works, we borrow money from friends and family and they are the first position mortgage. So some banks have seasoning requirements anywhere from zero days to 18 months. So it really depends on like what the bank that we're about to refinance with wants. And there's a fine line between how fast can we and how fast should we? Because since these are our friends and family, we borrow money from, you know, eight to 12%. Um, we want them to make money. So we have to pay them a certain amount. So generally we kind of guarantee at least 12 months worth of uh, interest payments. Um, to keep everybody happy. It's got to be a win-win. So uh, we get to make money. They get to make money. Everybody gets to make money. Everybody makes money. Thanks, REI TV. And hey, I appreciate you coming back. I think you're on a streak, man. I think, I think, I've, I think you've asked great questions for three weeks in a row. So thanks. All right. We ended up uh, getting to the bottom of the comment list. What or oh, what will we do now? You guys gonna ask me some questions? It's probably a delay too. Yeah, Cameron, let me know if I answered your question about FHA. And don't worry about redundant content. Everybody hops in at a different place. I don't mind repeating myself. The only thing that I really don't like talking about is legal structure. <laughs> I just, I don't know anything about it. There's no real good way to do it. It's all about personal preference, really. Let's see. We're doing a short sale. One of the properties that we have on a contract was a short sale. There's nothing short about a short sale. Boy, that thing is taking forever. But we just agreed on the price. Us and the bank. How long are your streams? Is there a number of questions we can answer or ask? No. Yeah, the streams are as long as people ask questions. So I'll probably hop off here today around 10 a.m. That was kind of my loose idea. We've been going for an hour and 12 minutes. So what, we'll get to a little bit over two hours before we uh, call it quits. And yeah, I mean, the whole point of the live stream, in my opinion, is to, you know, allow the people that have been so kind to subscribe to this channel to get their actual questions answered in any of the like, perceived barriers that you may have to pull the trigger on real estate investing. Um, get those answered and get those barriers out of the way so that you could start building generational wealth uh, faster and, you know, just take more over more control of uh, how you spend your time. I think because I, my story is uh, my dad grew up like the worst of the worst. Uh, like he, not from like an attitude or behavior perspective, like, but just, you know, horrible home life, very inconsistent and uh, like extraordinarily like low income to the point of like, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if he really minds me sharing this or not, but like he was like, he ate uh, paper and like sugar sandwiches at times because there was nothing to put inside the sandwich. And him and my mom both went to like great lengths to break that cycle and uh, not live in the same way that everyone in their surroundings uh, have. So uh, I am not a silver spooned individual. My parents created like a phenomenal home life for me and my brother and I are forever thankful. But truly, um, I think 
real estate investing is unbeatable and the best way to dramatically change your financial position and create for yourself like a legacy of assets that can actually be passed down to your to your kids. So I got into real estate investing about three years ago. And before that, I didn't really know anybody uh, that was in it. And I had no concept of like how money worked or how to attempt to build wealth. So at that point, uh, you know, my wife and I, when we got married, we had a kid and it was important for us that she be a stay at home mom. At the time I was in law enforcement, making like 44 grand a year. And I was just trying to figure out how to make more money so that my wife could be a stay at home mom. Now we've done that. And now, and now we pay over 44 grand a year in property taxes. So that's a fun story, right? That's a fun useless metric that I just kind of keep in mind. So, I mean, everything that we have uh, has been built over like the past three years. And I think it's one of those freely give, freely receive things, uh, excuse me, freely receive, freely give. So I read tons of books, which were very helpful. I had a lot of mentors, uh, people that really just took me under their wing and showed me exactly how they were doing things and uh, how I could do it too. And ultimately, since it has had such an impact on my life so quickly, um, I just want to answer everyone else's questions. And I kind of want to, as I'm growing, become the person that uh, become like the people that were very influential to me and kind enough to take me under their wing, answer all of my questions, always make time for me to help me work through uh, any of the hangups or, you know, troubles I was having making decisions. So yeah, you can ask as many questions as you want to. I'm happy that you found the channel. I'm happy that you hopped on this live stream and, uh, knock yourself out, man. Really, whatever you want to talk about that is getting in the way of you buying real estate. Let's talk about it. And I also just real estate investing as a whole, and I've said this and I meant to circle back to it while I was speaking, but like those mentors, again, freely, freely, freely receive. I never paid them anything. Um, and you've got these real estate. I've never paid for a real estate course. So I don't think none of this knowledge is like new. It's been around. I mean, we have a duplex that, is, that was built in like the 1800s. So it was, it has been a, income producing property, uh, you know, for longer than most businesses have been around. And this property that Andrew drains, Antoine, Antoine drains just, uh, put up here, North Broadway, that property was built in 1919. This isn't new. This isn't uh, cutting edge technology. This isn't, uh, difficult. So you shouldn't have to pay or be, uh, tricked into paying for real estate investing courses for tens of thousands of dollars by people that, I won't be able to tell you anything that you could find in a couple of books. So in my opinion, I'm just doing my part to kind of cut through the nonsense to first give back and also uh, slowly, very subtly fight against the nonsense that is out there that people are charging for. It's okay, man. No rush. Having a hard time understanding why my agent keeps pushing his own lender company. I shopped around and found one I liked, but he's not really happy about it. Red flags. It's not a red flag. It's just, uh, it's not a red flag at all. I mean, you, you do whatever you want to do. You, congrats, uh, Glenda, on being a, a free thinker uh, and thinking for yourself. Uh, referrals go a long way in relationships. And a lot of people that work on commissions um, you know, they kind of stand in support of each other when they send people, uh, to each other's way, each other's way. And there are some networking groups like BNI that all they care about is the number of referrals that are passed around throughout that group. So I had an agent recently, uh, get very frustrated with me for not wanting to use the title company that she wanted to. And it's just like, look, I'm the one paying for it. <laughs> uh, I can pick whoever I want to. Uh, thank you for your recommendation, uh, and I will decline. So uh, you do what's best for you, and don't let people push you around, which it sounds like you're not, and it's okay that they're getting angry. It just, 
Uh, you know, it's, that's a them problem, not a Glenda problem. Happy Friday to you, Brown Sugar. Thanks for coming back. If I have enough savings to cover rehabs, would you recommend the FHA loans to begin with? Uh, well, the part of the FHA loan is that they cover the rehab in that loan. Uh, that's the point of the FHA 203K is it's going to be the purchase price plus the renovations. Uh, and then you'd still only have to put like three and a half to five percent down. So, um, I mean, you could if you have enough in savings, then I wouldn't necessarily go FHA. I would just go uh, with like a conventional loan. If you go with a conventional loan and you put like three and a half, five percent down and then you're able to make the repairs, that's what I would do. Um, and you should be able to get a conventional loan so long as the property is like habitable. So long as there's not like subfloor exposed, a gaping hole in the roof, things like that. But yeah, you should be fine. I think you're on it. Are there any other forms of loans you would recommend to begin with? For sure. I mean, so here's the thing about real estate investing. And I think this is kind of overlooked. Like right now, uh, I mean, if you look throughout the history of loans for real estate, I think the average interest rate um, or the interest rates, historically speaking, are from like, you know, 0% to like 18%. And 18, I think that was in the 70s, uh, when that was like, you go into your bank to buy a home and they give you an 18% loan, right? So historically speaking, we are in a time where interest rates are extraordinarily low. If we're talking about a property that you are going to hold on to forever, uh, I am happy with anywhere under 8%. Uh, I've got a few amortized loans over like 10 years at 9% and I will not refinance out of them. I'm happy with those. They cash flow even after 9%. So when you're starting out, I mean, obviously the lower the interest rate and the longer the amortization period, the more cash flow you're going to get. But at the end of the day, I think you should keep in light that we are in historic, historic lows for interest rates. So almost any loan that you can get through a bank at the moment, is probably going to be good. So now we're just talking about the nuances of what are the origination fees? Um, how many extra things is that lender going to charge you for? Uh, and getting the actual closing costs as low as possible. Other than that, if you can walk into a bank and get a loan right now, it's probably, probably a good, a good deal. I hope that's helpful. What's your favorite properties to buy? HUD, bank owned, et cetera. Yes, I like to buy all of them. So, I mean, I've got my spreadsheet open of the properties that we have. So, I mean, let me see. I mean, it's a mix. If you were on here earlier when I was talking about like the eight uh, streams of deal flow, I think it's important to have all of those. A lot of these are MLS, some referrals, a bunch of off-market stuff from other investors. Um, I mean, HUD homes are fun because they're generally a little bit cheaper and you can have access to the interior before you get them. And generally there's a little bit of meat on the bone after the renovations, you're gonna have some equity left. Yeah, I mean, pretty much any way you can buy a property is a good way to buy a property. All types of properties are good, but it comes down to like what you want to do. I mean, I'm trying to build a larger portfolio of single family homes. So I like the HUD homes. I like the foreclosures. I like the share of sales. I like the MLS properties. I like the rent ready properties. I like, um, I like the seller finance properties. I like all the properties. Thanks, man. I appreciate you saying that. Thank you for having the heart to give back great advice and help others along the way. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. What is your favorite way to find comps for a property? Great question. Brown sugar 111. It's uh, prop stream. It's prop stream. They make it extraordinarily easy. So I would say prop stream, the, the, I would say, maybe 60% of the way that I interact with that software 
is for pulling comps so that I can know exactly uh, what I'm getting into and make sure that I am setting myself up for success. So uh, prop stream, it allows you to see pictures of the other properties. Um, it's all very convenient in one, one spot and it even allows you to uh, generate like really kind of pretty and professional comp reports that give you like a, a low, an average and a high end comparable. So it's fun. Uh, let's see. I'm uh, trying to figure out. You got a. I don't know what that is that tyrannical said, but I'm I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna go ahead and uh I'm gonna go ahead and block you, buddy. Nice. That felt good. That was the first time I did that. I'm really impressed, honestly. Let's see here. We still we have 21 people in the chat. You guys keep it very respectful. You guys ask very good questions. My one of my one of my biggest fears about doing this live stream is just having a bunch of nonsense in the comment section. But uh you guys don't. You guys are really cool. I like you a lot. <laughs> Why are you more focused on single family homes versus multi? Uh, personal preference. I don't think there's a right or wrong. I think if you talk to like multifamily guys, they will tell you how silly it is to invest in single family homes. And I, I refuse to reciprocate that. So I think if you enjoy multifamilies, it's definitely a good way to make money. It's definitely an easier way to scale. It's definitely um, on some ends lower on the cost side of things. For me, I am a huge fan of the single family market because it seems to be a little bit more hands off. Um, the multifamilies that we do have are just a little bit more management intensive. Uh, I do not like paying for any of the shared utilities, the water, sewer, trash. I don't like being responsible for that. I don't like being responsible for keeping the lot clean, cleaning the lot, uh, the lawn care, trash removal, uh, snow removal. I don't like being responsible for any of that stuff. And I also am not uh, a big fan of like the intra tenant drama that sometimes comes with multifamilies. And those those are all like my personal preference. It's not like a right or wrong. The other half of the single family space is um, it just allows you to go into an area and improve it, increase like the pride of ownership, uh, the amount of deferred maintenance on the street and I'm in like the, you know, the infancy stages of like working this out. But if I concentrate on acquiring single family homes in like a particular area, uh, we're ultimately going to switch. We've told ourselves that once we get to 120 properties, we're going to slow down on the single family front and then start focusing on like, okay, what is the overall experience of living in this area? And then slowly try to um, where we can, where we have the means to do so improve the experience of living in that community. I have no idea what that really means yet. It's not fully fleshed out, but uh, I think that would just be a cool uh, way to kind of have a positive impact on, you know, the area that, that we're invested in. Um, other than that, you know, I get that on multifamilies, there's like one roof that you have to replace, but I really enjoy kind of like partnering with residents to keep the properties in, in really good shape, which is possible on the multifamily side of things. But um, so far, I just have kind of found a sweet spot in the in in the in the single family homes. I know what I'm doing at this point, and it's just kind of it's just kind of pretty easy. Whereas I can kind of. I can kind of solve a lot of the problems that are associated with single family homes at this point, uh, kind of, I'm not going to say in my sleep, but uh, without thinking too hard. And then on the multifamily side of things, since I'm, I don't have that much experience in it, uh, I kind of shy away from it for like, perhaps just even like a comfort sake of things. I'm more comfortable with the single family space. And there's one other thing that I was going to say as I was having that thought, and I've already lost it. Silly brain. Single families versus multis. If you got a good thing going for you. Oh, yeah, that was the, that was the other thing. When it comes to multifamily properties, 
Uh, I tried to get into them a couple years ago, and it was very competitive. It's run by the numbers. I guess I'm a, I'm a fan of like forced appreciation on the multifamily side. So that's a pro uh, for multis that isn't there for single family homes. But uh, one of the ways that we've been able to build a pretty massive amount of equity is by helping out uh, like kind of distressed owners of single family homes. A lot of the single, I'm not going to say a lot, but we have had uh, probably over 20 or 30 opportunities to uh, just take a, a property for pretty cheap that really didn't need much. The people just really did not want it. They inherited it from some sort of estate. And that happens here in Ohio in like the four unit space, as you know, as well. It's just uh, more infrequent. So we've been able to build a lot of equity by being able to buy properties very quickly from distressed sellers. So on the multifamily side of things in negotiations, you are pretty much always going up against other investors. Uh, that are looking at the same numbers, doing the same thing, that uh, have the same ability to perform. Whereas in the single family space, uh, there's a lot more opportunity to get a heavily discounted property because it's not in the condition to sell to like a retail homeowner person. And that person doesn't have like the education, the means, or just like the knowledge or experience to like get it uh, to the type of condition that would sell on the homeowner side of things. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you asking that question. That was very helpful. Thanks for your thoughts, experience, and that you spend your time to help us. You're the best. Thanks, man. I really appreciate you. And again, I'm really ready to uh, learn how to pronounce your name. <laughs> give, give me a hint, man. Can you, uh, uh, man, what's it called? Transcribe, transliterate. Uh, give me some American letters. <laughs> uh, what's your take on long distance out of state real estate investment? What kind of team do I need to build to effectively pull this through? Um, I mean, I think you can do it. I think uh, I wouldn't want to do it. I don't think. Um, I mean, the best way to build a team is to scale to the point where you have enough work to keep your team busy, right? I think it would be difficult to build uh, a, a quote unquote team. If you have like, you know, one or two properties, the people that I know, I mean, you could you could build strong relationships with people um, and they, you know, would have the desire to help you. But as far as like getting full commitment from someone, I think that's difficult to do when you have just a couple properties. As far as out of state investing goes, I on the insurance agency side, I insure a lot of out of state investors. And I think the ones that do it the best uh, they regularly visit their properties. They regularly come back, set eyes on it, follow up on their contractors. Um, and they have also formed relationships with people that truly have their best interest. Uh, they become friends with people on a personal level, even outside of the real estate. And I think that's important because especially if you have, um, you know, like a property manager, a contractor, if you've got one property and it's rented out for like $800, then you're making that property manager $80 a month. It's hard to command uh, a bunch of attention or above average service for $80 a month. Um, same, same thing with the contractors. So if you develop a relationship on the personal side, if you really foster that, uh, then you're probably gonna, that's probably my biggest recommendation for out-of-state investors. Um, what else? And then regularly come to whatever area you're investing to check up on it. Uh, the other ones that I know that are doing it very successfully, they have like friends and family. So like just because they live in Colorado or Washington or California, they have family here in Ohio. So, um, their, their family will keep an eye on things kind of casually for them. Is there a minimum to invest with you? Uh, the minimum is just that we be friends, we be friends or family. Uh, and that <laughs> that's a, not really, uh, generally because we do mainly, well, we, we do, uh, first position mortgages on properties. So generally I wouldn't say we have a minimum so much as, 
let's say somebody were to say, hey, I would love to invest like $15,000 with you, then we would have to find a property for $15,000 or less in order to give them a first position mortgage on that property. Or we would have to have another asset in our portfolio uh, that a second mortgage or that's free and clear uh, that we could put a first position mortgage on that property to utilize those funds. So since it's on a first position mortgage basis, generally um, it's one investor per property. And here our average, because the market has been increasing, I would say at one point our average purchase price was around 30 or 40,000. Now it's more like 50, maybe 60. Like today, one of the properties that we're buying is 52,500. And I mean, as I was walking through it, uh, you know, it just, it, it's tough. And I've only been doing this for three years and you, you have been in the game a lot longer than I have. So I'm sure you're feeling it as well. But, you know, I walk through that property and it's just like, man, I used to buy these every, every day for, you know, 30 grand. And now we're paying 52 for the same condition, same location. Uh, same rent. <laughs> so it's a, it's a different pill to swallow. Can you share some titles of the books from the shelf behind you or the ones you got the most value in building your knowledge? Yeah, absolutely. I actually have a list. I have a massive Excel spreadsheet of all of the books that I've ever read. As I was first starting out and really wanted to like learn how to change my life. Um, I, I, I know like, you know, Warren Buffett is a big, uh, he, you know, he, at one point he said that he reads for like eight hours a day. He talks about how like knowledge is uh, compounding, which I totally believe and is true. But I, I, I found all these people that were saying, read, 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 but they never really said what to read. So that rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like that. I just wish somebody told me all the books that I really needed to read. So obviously... It's tough to do that, but I decided that when I was starting this, I was going to uh, keep track of all the books that I read so that I could just show people, hey, if you want to know everything that I know, just read these books. And I've done a moderately good job at actually keeping up with it. I think I would say about 60% of the books that I've read are on here. So it's a pretty long list. Um, but it's not as, as, as thorough as I tried to be. It doesn't have all of them on there. The Wealthy Gardener is definitely the the first book that I would recommend most people read. I think if you're talking about like self improvement, uh, building wealth, kind of sort of pseudo personal finance, I think The Wealthy Gardener is the best book that has been written in this space uh, for the past like ten years. I would say I, I truly, truly love that book, and I was fortunate enough to interview the author on this YouTube channel, and uh, you know I'm happy to say that him and I have become moderately good friends. Let's see. Properties with all utilities off on initial inspection. Would you pursue or pass? I mean, I don't think I would have an issue with that. So, you know, if utilities are off, you're generally responsible for anything, um, what, inside the house, sometimes to the streets. So, I mean, if you're talking about like the electric inside the walls, um, it's hard to mess up electric inside the walls. Uh, you, if you can go down to the basement, and see that all the wiring is actually connected. Um, you're probably good for the gas. I mean, the actual plumbing for gas is pretty cheap. You know, furnaces, it's one of those things that, I mean, a furnace is what, like $1,500? The install is, you know, maybe like another grand or another 1500 So you're looking at like a $3,000 thing for the furnace if the furnace doesn't work right. So. If the electric is off, getting a new panel in and new uh, new service, I mean, that's generally like 1500 bucks. A new furnace um, is like three grand. So that's the gas. If you need to like replace the plumbing from uh, the meter 
to your furnace. I mean, that might be like three or 400 bucks. And then if you have to replace all of the plumbing in the home, uh, it's generally what, three to four grand. So if the utilities are off, just know that you might have like eight grand, eight to nine grand that you might have to, worst case scenario, you might have to spend an extra eight or nine grand. So just, you know, consider that in your numbers um, and make an offer according to that. So a lot of people ask me like what my red flags are as I'm looking for properties. And I think that's a really good question. And the more I get into it, the less red flags I see and the more, uh, like the cool thing about real estate investing, you know, we just went over the fact that it's been around for a long time. Uh, and there are entire industries built around supporting real estate. So anything that could possibly go wrong with a house ultimately uh, has a corresponding dollar amount. So, you know, if you see like uh, Tolu asked earlier uh, in the foundation, uh, the foundation settling, okay, well now we just have to figure out what that corresponding dollar amount is and adjust our offer accordingly. So I found that, you know, if you're forthright about the corresponding dollar amount and you approach that information, approach the seller with that information, uh, generally they agree. So generally, or they don't and you walk, but you keep your money and you're not subject to that dollar amount anymore. So, you know, um, if you're thorough and you truly, uh, assess a property and try to figure out all the appropriate corresponding dollar values with anything that looks questionable ab about the properties, then it becomes a little bit easier to kind of handle. Um, like basement windows. We've been, we've been going on a kick lately. We've been taking out all the basement windows and putting in glass blocks. So uh, we've replaced all the glass block windows in a couple homes recently. It's been like $800 and it does a world, world of improvement on the, uh, on the overall look of the home. And then the gutters are another big thing. Uh, a lot of the foundation or like the water issues inside of a basement can just be fixed by running the gutters right and trenching out the gutters or the downspouts to the appropriate place, getting it far away from the house. So good question. You ready for the next level? I see you on stage teaching thousands at a time. Just keep stepping up and giving, man, you're the best. Thanks for saying that. That, that warms up my heart for the day. I, and truly, man, I am, I am so thankful for all of the people, especially this live stream. I mean, I, I love it. And like 18 people are on right now. And I've heard from a lot of people that, you know, they've got their significant other or kid with them watching. So, you know, the real number could be as high as like 30 or something. But regardless, I mean, even 18, that is a, that's a, that's a classroom full of people, you know, in college, I took courses with less than 18 people in there. So I'm very thankful for the opportunity. I'm very thankful that you guys regularly show up. I'm thankful for you guys for like sharing this channel uh, with, you know, your friends. And I'm, I'm thankful that you guys are actually taking the information that we talk about here on this live stream and actually, um, you know, uh, deploying that information and going out and buying properties, looking at properties, networking. It's, it's super, super encouraging. I, I love it. Partnering with families, awesome perspective. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Neighbor problems with multifamilies. Yeah, just like, you know, they have a dog. They shouldn't have a dog. That dog barks too loud. It keeps me up. Those people fight all night. Uh, somebody's smoking weed. Uh, I'm smelling weed all in my apartment. Um, you know, you know, it, their TV is too loud. They listen to their TV all, all the time. You know, I know they've got three kids upstairs, but it sounds like elephants. <laughs> you know, all the things that you would expect. Those are the things I'm talking about. Yeah, happy Friday to you too, man. As a successful investor, which books do you recommend for a beginner? Well, thank you, Glenda, for considering me to be a successful investor. The jury's still out, though. A lot can go wrong. Uh, the Wealthy Gardener is a favorite of mine. I like it a lot. As far as like real estate investing goes, uh, Building Wealth One House at a Time by J.J. Schwab. 
That's a favorite of mine. Michael Zuber has a book uh, with a similar title, uh, One Rental at a Time, I think is the name of it. Um, there's a guy, his name is Gary Keller. He's got two good books, uh, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor. I would look at that one. Uh, the thing about books that I never really circled back to is like, which, which ones would you recommend? You know, uh, wisdom is a really, uh oh, I went the wrong way. It's a, it's a idea that's really near and dear to my heart. And it is, it is almost impossible to pinpoint one book that has all of the answers. Um, you know, I'm a Christian. So if I had to point at one book, <laughs> I would say the Bible. Um, but you know, I, Wisdom is one of those things that is gradually collected from, you know, millions of different sources, right? So, you know, uh, which real estate books should I read? Realistically, the answer is all of them. And then somewhere in that, uh, in, in doing that, in the pursuit of that, you are going to find patterns. You're going to form your own personal preferences. Uh, you're going to find things that you're comfortable with. You're going to find things that you will never under any circumstances do. Right. And I think that's like the beauty of books is it's one person's perspective uh, about what they have done or uh, one person's perspective about a theory or idea. Right. So you are a very extraordinarily unique individual that has your own strengths, your own weaknesses, your own personal preferences, your own taste, your own artistic spin that you're going to put on everything that you do. So you have this, you know, unique uh, gift that you can offer the world and uh, you're going to be able to further define that the more input that you kind of filter through. So, uh, that's my answer is constantly learn, constantly educate and figure out what really strikes a chord with you and then go out and do that. So I often recommend that if like, like knowing myself, like if I'm interested in a topic, one of the things that I do is I find 10 books on that topic and I commit to myself before I go into a new industry or whatever, I read 10 books uh, on that topic. And then Somewhere in there, I'll start to find the patterns. I'll start to think, uh, find the things that I think I, I would be very good at. And then I find the things that do not appeal to me and that I'll probably avoid. And doing that, especially if you're a beginner, uh, reading through the 10 books after that. I mean, how many people do you know that have really read 10 books on anything, right? So it's like a kind of a good starting point to become an expert in a field is those first 10 books. And then you're going to be able to mitigate your mistakes as you are out there putting your newly acquired knowledge into action. Long answer. I hope that helps. I do not have a W-2 job, but my spouse business partner does. It's not high income. Uh, do you think banks will work with us? Uh, probably. I mean, banks make money by giving money away, right? Um, that's how, you know, they make money on the interest spread. So I would say you're going to have to look long and hard, but you will likely find a bank that's willing to take a chance on you. I have found that the smaller regional local banks are likely the ones that are more apt to, um, take a chance on you. And I mean, you know, realistically speaking, it's just a matter of time before, before you are bankable. Right. So Long story to say, there is some way that you can get bank financing. It's out there. You just have to look long and hard. Uh, my brother shared with the mastermind group a couple days ago that he had called seven banks that morning. So even though, even though according to, according to Glenda, even though I'm a successful investor, <laughs> um, you know, we still are constantly searching for banks that are willing to work with us. So just as feverishly as I look for properties for us to purchase, my brother looks for banks that are interested in working with us. This is a phenomenal uh, list of books that I have read. I'm not saying all the books on there are phenomenal. I'm saying the list is phenomenal because it's a phenomenal list of the books that I've read. And it's phenomenal because it's a list of books that I've read. Um, I don't know many people that keep lists of books they've read and I did my best. It's phenomenal. It's like 60%. I tried, I tried hard. No, you rock WB blue. 
Thanks, man. I want to add more singles as well. I like them. I'm thankful I found you. I'm thankful you commented uh, on the on the channel, <laughs> Veronica McGowan. So close to McGowan. McGowan. Ryan, I have a good one for you. I'm finishing my book. It's on financial literacy. Uh, it will be great. Would you like to write the forward in it? It's free marketing for you, and I really like your generosity. Thanks, man. Uh, sure, send me an email. I will. I will read it. I will read it. There's my email address. Shoot me one over, and we'll talk. I don't see why not. The potential downsides of me doing that is time lost if you have a horrible book, but I doubt your book is horrible. Is 3K enough to get into real estate? Probably not. I mean, maybe. I mean, it's up to you. It's up to you. Um, realistically speaking, $3,000 is enough to replace a simple roof redo the plumbing, um, you know, switch out a water heater. So my answer to this question generally is however much money that you're starting with is probably not enough to get into real estate investing. There's this spreadsheet that I did that calculates all of, let me find it real quick and share it. It calculates like everything that could go wrong on a property and how much it would cost. So I think, um, I think the biggest thing for people that are looking to get into real estate and they don't necessarily have a high income job or a bunch of money in savings is you want to figure out in what areas are you deficient as far as providing value to society or saving money when you come across it. So, I mean, here in America, you know, most people have an unlimited amount of opportunity ahead of them, right? So with $3,000, my biggest challenge to you would be figure out how to make more money and figure out how to spend less. Now, there are two sides of real estate investing, right? If you are a high income earner, then you are already bankable. Uh, if you have a W-2 job, you are already bankable. You can walk into most banks and get loans for real estate. Uh, you can start by getting owner occupied properties and you could start by, you know, maybe even house hacking. And then you could build your rental portfolio on the back of traditional banks. Then you have other people like, um, man, how did I forget this guy already? I'm so sorry. Uh, Cameron Bennett. Uh, I lost your name, buddy. I didn't forget you. I just couldn't think of who said that. Um, who They don't have a W-2 job and consequently are not bankable. So at that point, you can get extraordinarily creative. And if Antoine is down with me sharing it, I mean, he has built his entire portfolio uh, using creative financing, seller financing, um, getting into properties with like little or no money down. Uh, but you are providing a value and you are being extraordinarily risky until your cash flow from the properties are sufficient to be an income to you. But that's a that's a great deal of risk because kind of to my first point, $3,000 is probably not enough to handle um, most things that could go wrong with a property. And then once you uh, get rid of that $3,000 or spend it, uh, what are you going to do then? Uh, now you have a property that you can't properly maintain, right? So if you take on an extraordinary amount of risk, if you are willing to uh, go out there and find properties that are distressed, that have distressed, uh, you know, sellers, if you're looking forward to like uh, getting involved in private investors, learning how to borrow money, but at the same time, sure, you're getting into real estate uh, with no money down, but on the flip side, you're providing you're increasing your value to society by learning how to uh, benefit society more, right? So if you are identifying distressed properties and negotiating creatively on how to sell them, then you're adding value by taking away the burden of that distressed property. 
if you are borrowing money from uh, private investors and convincing friends and family to lend you money, then you're doing two things. You are uh, providing value by uh, educating and teaching these individuals how they can make a better and more secure return on their money than with traditional means. You're also, uh, you know, gaining confidence and uh, networking, right? Which all increases the uh, overall intrinsic value that you have to society. So I know this is not like a nice thing to say or uh, a warm and fuzzy thing. So I guess I have two answers. $3,000 is not enough and you should challenge yourself to find all of the ways that uh, led you to only having $3,000. And also $3,000 is enough to get started because you don't necessarily need any money to get started. You just need to be hungry. You need to be interested in making the personal growth, the personal changes necessary to uh, provide more value to society, to consume less, right? Uh, so make more money and spend less money and, you know, start focusing all of your efforts on how to better the community around you. So it, it all starts internal. And I would say, um, I remember like everything clicking in my head one night, I was still in law enforcement and this sounds super cheesy, but like I became a millionaire on a mental perspective, even though I, I was by no means, I had less than a hundred grand, uh, but mentally I knew that I had finally figured out exactly what I needed to do with all of my funds and all of my energy uh, so that one day I would be a millionaire. So it, it all happens internally and mental before it, it, and mentally before it happens like in the corresponding real world. Hmm. Indeed, I'm on the same page with you. What an awesome guy. Give him so much. So many for, man, you guys are awesome. You guys sure are. As a Christian, I'll be reading the Bible more and much more books. Read, read, read. Great answer. I'll start with building wealth uh, one book at a time. <laughs> building wealth one book at a time. Did I say that? Uh, building wealth one house at a time. <laughs> but hey, maybe that's a book that I should write. Maybe I should write the book, Building Wealth <laughs> One Book at a Time. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, does your company do property management or even financing for other real estate investors or companies? Not really. Uh, we have a few uh, investments in first position mortgages with uh, some people. Uh, as far as property management goes, we manage our own properties, but we are not interested in managing the properties of anyone else. Um, uh, you have to be like a realtor and a broker and have a whole bunch of notches on your belt in order to do that. How's things going with your property management company? Really well. Uh, we hired a guy to do the leasing and also to help us out with all of our collections. So that has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, he, uh, two times this week, we have closed on a property and he has rented it out within 24 hours. So uh, I guess it's true. More hands make less work, <laughs> right? So now that we have him on board, uh, it's really going to be able to allow us to accomplish more in the same amount of time. And we're also really, now that we kind of feel like we have most things under control, um, because we've only been doing property management since I think June of last year, so about a year. So now I feel like we've got everything kind of situated and settled. So now we're going to start focusing on the metrics uh, or like the things that we can control. How long do properties stay vacant. Um, that's going to be a, a good one. And then um, really getting down, you know, people are always going to be late. Uh, life happens. But historically, since we took over, we have not been doing a good job at making sure that we are actually charging late fees. Um, and we have not been quick enough to like post three day notices and start the eviction process. Now, you know, the state of the world has uh, something to do with that too. But um, now that most things are starting to clear up a little bit, uh, we can start monitoring those metrics and really, really driving in uh, and taking control of those, of those big metrics. Appfolio is the name of the system. Uh, you have to have about 50 properties in order to actually get on that. But Appfolio is good. I like them a lot. There are some things that they made really easy, but 
there's another software called Rent Manager. And one of my mentors uses that. And I think that is just a little bit more robust. Um, and part of me, part of me wishes I went with Rent Manager, not Appfolio. So those are the two that I would suggest. All righty. What is up? We are in, we are at the end of the comment section and we've got 21 people on. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate everybody being here and we've got 19 likes. That's fun. You guys are really cool. So what questions do you all have? Um, I have about five minutes left before I need to skedaddle or skadoodle. Let's see. Oh, Antoine, the other thing that we're going to start uh, actually trying to keep up with is uh, raising the rents on an annual basis. Uh, of course, that's going to be on a case by case basis, not just like across the board. Some are already pretty close or above market, but there are also others that we've purchased, occupied, and we've just never raised the rent. So, and I mean, we won't raise it much, but there are a few properties that we're happy to own. We like the people that are living there, but I mean, because their rents are so low, we only clear like $30. And I'm speaking about one property in particular, and that person has been there for over 30 years. So what are you going to do, you know? Let's see, man. Well, we might be we might be done for the day. These uh, these questions really slowed down, and we went from twenty one to seventeen pretty quickly. So maybe you guys threw in the towel. <laughs> Two hours is a long time. I appreciate the people that have been on here from start to finish. That's super cool, super cool. Man, still no questions. All right. Well, I'm going to call it a day then. Um, oh, wait a second. There are some questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do you recommend beginning with purchasing properties from tax liens? Uh, no, I recommend getting into purchasing properties by the most convenient method available to you. I don't think there's one way to acquire a property that's superior uh, than others. <laughs> Not true. I lied. Uh, the best way to acquire property is for free. <laughs> Find people to give you free properties, and that is the most superior way to acquire properties. What great advice to end the live stream on this morning. Except the real estate, do you consider getting into other streams of cash flow? If yes, which ones? We own businesses. So we own a couple businesses that are cash flow. Um, we've sold a couple businesses which are cash flow, and we own some properties that cash flow. <laughs> yeah, businesses and real estate, businesses that provide value um, to society and uh, real estate. That's our two main things. So we're pretty much open to most businesses, so long as they provide a value. We've got some criteria there, and we would like to, we would like to own more businesses. Um, a good friend of mine, his name is Paul Maskill. He owns a lot of businesses, and he's really good at buying businesses. And I've got a few other friends that are really good at buying businesses. So I'm just trying to learn from them on... Um, you know, just exploring like the franchise side of things or the like owner operated uh, type businesses that 
need a partner uh, to kind of help those types of things. But I don't like stocks. I don't like stocks at all. Uh, for all the things that we do, uh, having positive control over the metrics is really important to us. And with stocks or most other investments, there's it's not there's not that much positive control there. So uh, it becomes more speculative and more kind of faith based, like faith in that company or whatever. And if things go sideways, um, there's nothing that you can do about it, and there's no accountability on their on their side either. Again, speaking about stocks, so. If you invest in the company and the company goes south, they're going to say, whoopsies, you should have known it's risky, you know, and that's just not fair because it's not like they lost any money. You figure it out, man, and you let me know free houses are the best kind of houses. Once you uh, get a system down uh, to find free houses, let me know and I'll be your number one customer. Uh, we there are a few in all seriousness there are a few programs out there um, the ones that we got you know some people are willing to give houses away for free because they just want to get rid of them and uh, they're not in the best of shape um, sometimes the cities or governments will come up with fun little programs to like help the abandoned properties in the area um, those are really the only two ways that I know of either governments or really, really, really distressed people. So, all right. Well, I sure do appreciate everything. Uh, thank you all for being on here and see you next week, Friday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern standard time. All righty. Talk to you guys soon.